very much. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Hey, hey, Lee. Hey, Harvey. Ms. Hey, Jones. Ed. How are you? Ms. Jones, hello. <laughs> hey, Aaron. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Jim, Andy, Jamie. Good to have everybody with us tonight. Ed, someone, someone in Chattanooga asked me if this was going to be recorded. They couldn't they couldn't zoom in tonight. Um, is it is it gonna be possible to access this later? Well, as my friend Lee reminded me, it is recording right now. And yeah, I will uh, I, I, will send, I will send you the link. Oh, okay. So very good. Send, and I'll pass can, that on. Yeah, you can send that to everybody. And I, I put it on our YouTube channel uh for our uh our round okay. table. Okay. But I will send that to you and you can do with that as you as you uh want to do with. So great, thanks. Yes, sir, absolutely. <clears throat> I want to say this is an absolutely arresting uh, title and and topic. This is a real attention getter. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, I, I, I agree. agree. I agree. Definitely. I didn't mean to chase everybody else away. <laughs> no, hardly. <laughs> no, no, sir. <laughs> Uh, hey, Mike, Doug, good to have you with us. Mr. Gould Hagler, I believe. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Good to have you with us, sir. Stephen Hunter. Yep, Kirk, hello. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Go, dogs. Well, Tim graduated with his PhD from Alabama, so. Uh, I'll uh -oh. let you, I'll roll let tide, you, baby. I'll, I'll roll tide. <laughs> hey, folks, due to technical difficulties, we're going to have to cancel tonight's presentation. <laughs> uh, something's come up, so. <laughs> anyway. you, can just, you can just do a um, five-second delay, so if I break out of the whole tide, you can. You can... Yeah. Now, if I were from Florida State, that could be uh that really could be an issue. Uh, no. uh, they really I have some problems, so <laughs> of their own making. Yeah. Uh hey Julie, good to have you with us tonight. Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, their own making. Oh gosh, here we go. Yeah. Oh. Hope everybody's ready. For, everybody ready for Christmas? God, it's hard to believe it's like in eleven days. Oh my! Yeah. Good. I gosh. just walked a dog in twenty-six degree weather. It's easy for me to believe it. Oh um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey Tom, good to have you with us tonight, sir. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm talking. I was saying congratulations on the book. Ah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, that is, that's a good feeling. You know, uh, class, my sure class ended yesterday. The book is in print. I got nothing going on right now. So, hey, we got, wow. we got, we got, we have Jennifer, we have Dr. Jennifer Murray is going to join us tonight. Really? Wow. That wow. is, that is an hey, honor. Ed, Ed, wow. She yes. Is a, she's a contributor to the book I'm going to talk about tonight. Well, there we go. There you go. Yeah. That makes sense then to have the <laughs> esteemed Dr. Jennifer Murray with us this evening. Wow. That is. <laughs> <laughs> and she's an Auburn fan too. With hey, oh, Jim. Wow. Thanks, thanks for, for <laughs> zooming in tonight. Yeah. <laughs> War Eagles. <laughs> oh, bless her heart. Uh, bless don't her say heart. that too loud. My wife heard it in the other room. She's upset now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if y'all didn't hear, uh, Dr. Murray was a contributor to uh, to Tim's uh, book that comes out that comes out next year. So, yeah. But no, it's it's great to have her with us tonight. It absolutely is. Yeah. It's a great topic. It's a, it's it a, it's a, and a great topic. It really is. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was speaking up at, up in Nashville in the round table and I met Tim and we got to talk and say, Hey, I need a speaker for December. And he was like, Here we go. It looked like a really neat, neat topic. And yeah. So we'll get a couple of minutes, folks, that uh I will start us back up. Skip, good to have you from the uh uh from the West Coast, my friend. And from the great state of Massachusetts, actually. Oh, oh yeah, the Boston Tea Party. Wasn't that it? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Great. Great. I got, awesome. I got here yesterday. I left my 70 degree backyard <laughs> to, to 29 degrees or whatever the hell it is here. Uh, I'm going to go Saturday night to the you know actual event, but I will die. I, there's just no way I'm going to survive it. I brought every piece of warm clothing I had with me and it's not enough. Well, Where about California you're from? I'm from the from Palos Verdes, which is in the Los Angeles area. I know right where it is. I grew up in Los Angeles. I know right where it is. Oh, great. Where did you where you where you're from? Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles, but I lived in five different Southern California counties before I moved to Ohio. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the southwest corner of LA County. That's, that's, that's a really nice part of LA County to be in. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been there well, most of my life. It's great. It's well, great. My daughter, but my daughter went to UC questions. Irvine. Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's great. I, and I'm going to Cal Berkeley right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I retired and decided to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Skip, we can't have you die because we've got to have you next season for Otani's $700 million debut with uh, the L.A. Oh, Dodgers. So. God, yes. It, you and I amazing? are going back and yeah, we're going to go back and forth on that all season. I can't wait. It's going to, so. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Now, he didn't get the but best. But actually, I'm going to say something. I'm going to go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I've been talking about the weather, but actually, it's a Boston's a fantastic city. It really is. Yeah. 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 I got my little, little suite here. Um, there we you go. Know, the living room, dining room, an old, an old apartment building, and it's a great neighborhood. And yes, it's been, it's been fun this thing here for the last couple of days. Well, good. Well, folks, Rob, it's good to have you with us, gentlemen, um, ladies. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead great and get started. Here. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I would ask yes. you to go ahead and mute yourselves, lower left hand corner of the screen there, and. If you'd stop your video also, I think that helps on bandwidth, too. That would be good as well. And now we'll go ahead and get started. Let me share a screen here, my friends. Okay. Hey, folks, welcome to the last uh, presentation here for the calendar year uh, for Chickamauga and Chattanooga Civil War Roundtable. And... Uh, so again, hey, what we have coming up uh, next year, we have uh, the bottom. The bottom yeah, left. yeah, bottom left. Yeah, go ahead and mute yourself. Great. Again, uh, next year, next May, May 4th, we have a uh, uh, esteemed author, historian, Tim Smith, renowned for the Western Theater, giving us a tour of the Shiloh Battlefield. Uh, I think we have about a dozen people signed up for that and look forward to that. That'll be good. And and friends, if you're not a member of a roundtable, hey, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, you see the dues there for uh, uh, for be becoming a member uh, right there. And, and we certainly offer our presentations via Zoom. Um, and uh, hey, we are looking up, uh, looking at doing a, a hike up Rocky Face Ridge uh, around the Dalton area, maybe March, April time frame, uh, working that out with other roundtables. So. We'll see about that. Okay, this is our account. Account right now that'll take us through the rest of the rest of our calendar year, I guess, or our year uh, for the round table. So plenty to hold uh, hold us over. And uh, and again, if you're new here, Dr. Jennifer Murray has joined us this evening too for her talk. She helped uh, with Dr. Johnson and his book that comes out next year is which, which will be the focus of tonight's. Uh, discussion on uh, how the civil uh, the Mexican American War shaped Civil War generals, and who we have coming up uh, in the coming uh, 
coming months. Robert Plum next uh, next month for January, and he'll be talking to better the better angels, five women who changed Civil War America. And you see what we have uh, coming up for uh, the next next year through June. And of course, highlight there there is Robert Plum's book, uh, The Better Angels. And uh, then the other authors that we have uh, have remaining and their books also. <laughs> but uh, before I introduce Dr. Johnson, certainly want to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I hope it's a good tidings for all good health uh, for everybody. And, uh, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And folks, we are honored tonight to have with us uh, Dr. Tim Johnson. Uh, his bio here, he's a, I, yes, I have to say this, and it, it pains me to say this, but he's a uh, 1989 graduate PhD, earned his PhD in history from the University of, <clears throat> that university to the west of here, I guess to the south of here, rather, southwest, Alabama, roll tide, <laughs> go dogs. 1991, he became a, a joint of faculty at Lipscomb University. Uh, where he currently he's currently the Elizabeth Gentry Brown Professor of History, and has also been a recipient of Lipkins Lip, Lipskin's Outstanding Teacher Award. Uh, he's been a research fellow for the Virginia Historical Society and also for Yale University. Uh, that was back in 2005. Uh, he was a finalist for the Army Historical Foundation's Distinguished Writing Award, and he's appeared on. Uh, such programs uh, with C-SPAN, History Channel, and public television. He's authored dozen plus uh, articles and seven books on 19th century military history, primarily focused on the Mexican-American War. Uh, he's written biographies on Winfield Scott and it also the account of the 1847 uh, Mexican City Campaign 2007, uh, both published by the University Press of Kansas. In 2018, the University of Tennessee Press published his most recent book, For Duty and Honor, Tennessee's Mexican War Experience. And as the focus, again, of tonight's presentation, uh, which will be published next summer, uh, it's an edited collection of essays uh, from 12 of the country's leading Civil War scholars, including Dr. Murray, who examined the Mexican War experiences of 12 Civil War generals. And so it is my esteemed honor and privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Johnson. And sir, the floor is yours, and I will pick up your slides. All right. Here we go. Thank you, Ed, and thank you to everyone uh, for, for joining in this evening. I, uh, I am a native of Chattanooga, a 1975 graduate of East Ridge High School, so I'm just... Uh, scanning the names of the people who have uh, who zoomed in this evening and I, I see an old high school uh, friend uh, Les thank you for joining in um, I'm honored to be here uh, thank you for having me this is I think an important topic um, the slide that you see in front of you uh, is an early version of the title of this forthcoming book it, it's now on its third title and I think uh, uh, the final title, when it does appear, it, it, it will be the Mexican-American War Experiences of 12 Civil War Generals. Um, a lot of people, and, and over the years when I've, I've talked to uh, groups about the Mexican-American War, a lot of people think they know about the Mexican-American War, but, but they really don't. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had someone say, Oh, yeah, the Mexican War, the Alamo. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with that. Well, you know, they're only a decade off there. Um, that's, that's the Texas Revolution. And then just recently in Nashville, someone um, uh, was talking about the Mexican War, um, and they kept referring to it as the Spanish-American War. Well, you know, sorry, that's 1898. We are in the 1840s. We're talking about the war with Mexico from 1846 to 48. And it is a war of first, uh, a lot of first. It was our first expeditionary war, the first time we sent an army to another country to wage war. It's the first war in which West Point graduates 
have a real impact on the conduct of the war. It's the first war in which the United States Army has to deal with um, urban warfare uh, to a major degree, especially at the Battle of Monterey. Um, but I think that it's important, uh, What uh, to me, what has always fascinated me is the fact that um, over 300 future Civil War generals fought in Mexico. And so um, tonight I, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, just a few examples. We'll, we'll talk about, I don't know, half a dozen or so um, Civil War generals. These are names that you're all familiar with. You're, you know, all, all of the all of the famous Civil War names that you all know, they, they were all in Mexico. Lee, Grant, Hooker, McClellan, Meade, and, and, and Beauregard, and Jackson, Longstreet. They were all in Mexico. Uh, but for, for some reason, this is, this is the unforgotten, one of the unforgotten wars in American history. And it, it's, it's, it's a forgotten war. Um, for one reason, it was basically a land grab. Uh, we end up with uh, uh, 525,000 square miles. Uh, basically, the southwestern quadrant of the continent uh, was transferred from Mexico to the United States in 1848 under the terms of the treaty that ended the war. So the war was unpopular then, and it remains unpopular now for that reason. And, it, and it's largely forgotten. That's, that's unfortunate. There are actually reminders all around us of the war with Mexico. Um, this group that I'm talking to this evening, you all are from the Chattanooga area, uh, North Georgia, some of you, I, I suspect. You may already know this. Resaca, Georgia is named for the Battle of Resaca de la Palma, which was one of the early battles in, um, in 1846. Um, if you are from the Rossville or Ringgold area, just below the state line. Uh, maybe you know, I find that most people do not know that Ringgold was named for Samuel Ringgold, who was an artillery officer and actually the father of the flying artillery, which was a new innovation that was first put to use in Mexico in 1846-47. And Samuel Ringgold, uh, Major Ringgold, was one of the first American officers killed in the war. He was actually killed at uh, uh, at the Battle of Palo Alto. So, so there are reminders all around us. We often are not aware of it. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to share with you just a few. Really, really, this is just sort of an appetizer. I'm going to touch on a few generals and 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 suggest some things that uh, uh, some ways in which I think the Mexican War Mexican War experience informed Civil War leadership a decade and a half later. And I'm going to be drawing heavily from uh, what the contributors. I have a dozen contributors uh, from around the country who wrote the 12 essays that are the 12 chapters of this book. And um, Jennifer Murray is, is with us. She's one of them. I, I appreciate you joining in uh, this evening. And uh, I'm, I'm going to just touch on a few very quickly. These Each chapter is kind of a standalone chapter, and the authors really use, um, uh, offer their own interpretation about how the war in Mexico influenced uh, the uh, the person that they that they are uh, dealing with. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here is a list of the contributors. So you, you'll see, you'll recognize uh, a lot of these names, I suspect, if you've read very much about the Civil War. And of course, there's um, there's Jen's name up there. Um, so there there are some. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have some very uh, accomplished scholars. Uh, I think you're gonna um, you're gonna uh, have Tim Smith with a program um, in 2024. Uh, he wrote the essay on um, on Grant uh, for this volume. Um, Jennifer Murray did the uh, did the chapter on George Gordon Meade. Um, so there are your contributors. Okay, uh, next slide, please. For me, the war uh, with Mexico begins here. 
Uh, I love this story. This You'll recognize this as uh, a representation of Grant and Lee meeting at Appomattox um, in April 1865 at the end of the Civil War. I love the scene. I love this story. It, this, this scene just uh, drips with irony. Um, Lee, of course, has come to surrender to Grant. Uh, they greet each other. They sit across from each other about 10 feet apart. And Grant is the one who broke the silence. He was the first one to speak. And what does he say? He talks about Mexico. And he says, I knew you, or uh, we met. He said, we met in Mexico. You, you came to my commanding officer's headquarters and we met. I would know you anywhere. Lee, of course, was a rising star in the army in Mexico. Everyone knew who Lee was. He was a captain and he was on Winfield Scott's staff. Grant was a lieutenant at Anova, an ordnance officer in the 4th Infantry. And here they are at Appomattox. And Grant breaks the silence by saying, we met in Mexico and I remember you. And now I love this. Lee, Lee then says, I know we met there, but I don't, I don't remember you. Um, so they began with something they had in common. And Grant knew that he would find common ground by, by talking about Mexico with Lee. Um, next slide, please. So in this slide, perhaps you've seen this picture before. So I want you to look at the fellow on the left, kind of in the background, see if you know who that guy is. We're going to, I'm going to talk specifically about a few Civil War generals and, and give you some, uh, just a few points of uh, what, what I think that they uh, learned in Mexico that will um uh, that will influence their leadership later. Um, so if uh, now, now uh, fellow on the right, by the way, is Alexander Hayes. Th this image is from 1840, it's either 45 or 46, uh, just before the war with Mexico. Alexander Hayes uh, would be a general in the Civil War too, by the way, just just not as well known. And he was killed at uh, uh, killed at the wilderness uh, in 1864. But the fellow on the left, do you recognize him? Next slide, please. So uh, that's Lieutenant Grant um, on the left. So as I said, Grant was an ordnance officer. He was in the 4th Infantry. Uh, next slide, please. And so a few things that Grant uh, would have learned, things that he would have been able to carry with him. He learned a lot about logistics, of course, being in, in quartermaster. Uh, uh, he, uh, he learned at sort of at the grassroots level how to get supplies from point A to point B. He learned the, the basics about, about feeding his regiment. That's going to come in pretty handy uh, a decade and a half later. Um, Grant wrote in his memoirs, I'm not aware of ever having used a profane expletive in my life, but I would have the charity to excuse those who have done so if they were in charge of a train of Mexican pack mules at the time. So he kind of learned the hard way, uh, the, the art of transporting supplies. Uh, he also, um, he, he really kind of adopted Zachary Taylor's persona. Now, Taylor and Scott are... The, the 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 two principal generals, the commanders of the two principal U.S. armies in the Mexican War. Um, Taylor's army will fight uh, four battles, uh, four major battles in northern Mexico in the first year of the war. And then a, another army under Winfield Scott will be uh, organized. Uh, part of Taylor's army was transferred to Scott's command, and then Scott uh, will uh, uh, command what 
what we know as the Mexico City campaign in 1847. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But um, Grant fought in both of these armies. He served under Taylor first, and then he was transferred to Scott. He admired uh, Scott as a strategist and a tactician, but he emulated Taylor, Taylor's persona. You know, Taylor was kind of a soldier's general. He, he didn't he didn't wear the, the, the fancy uniforms. He didn't have the shoulder epaulets of a, of a general. Um, um, he was the kind of general that could relate to the common soldier. And Scott was not. Uh, Scott loved the pomp and the ceremony. And he had his uniforms tailor-made by a, uh, uh, a tailor in Paris, France, um, um, he, in, in fact, someone once said that Scott wore all of the uniform that was allowed by law. So he loved, he loved this show of, uh, uh, of, of uh, being in command and, and, and being, a, uh, being a general. Uh, Grant gravitated to Taylor's persona. And, and of course, if you remember from that image we began with at Appomattox, um, if you noticed, you know, Grant had mud splattered boots and, and uh, uh, he didn't have the, the kind, you know, the gold braid and sash and buttons that would uh, readily identify him as the commander of the army. Um, but Grant did observe Scott's close relationship with the Navy because Scott's army actually executed an amphibious landing at Veracruz in March 1847. It was the largest amphibious landing of an American army prior to World War II. Grant was there. He saw the relationship that, that Scott had with the Navy, and one wonders, uh, and, and, and in fact, Grant would later say that it was faultless, the cooperation between Scott's army and the Navy. And so one wonders how that influenced Grant later in the Civil War, because there were occasions, of course, when Grant had to cooperate with, uh, with naval forces at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, uh, at Shiloh, uh, and then again in 1863 in the Vicksburg Campaign. Uh, and also um, the flank moves that Grant executed around Vicksburg in 63 or in Northern Virginia in 64. Uh, some of those were very similar to various flank attacks that Grant had witnessed in Mexico. Next slide, please. So let's, let's move on to another fella. Anybody recognize this, this dapper young man? Next slide, please. Well, that's Captain Lee. Um, Lee, as I mentioned earlier, Lee was on Winfield Scott's staff. Lee was really General Scott's right hand. Uh, he did all of the important reconnaissance work for Lee. Uh, Lee relied heavily on, uh, I, I mean, Scott relied heavily on Lee. Uh, next slide, please. So Lee learns a lot about reconnaissance in Mexico. He executed some of the most important reconnaissance missions of, of the entire war. I'm thinking specifically of the Battle of Cerro Gordo um, in April 1847, and then the Battle of Contreras a few months later on the outskirts of Mexico City. At Cerro Gordo, by the way, Scott has now captured Veracruz. His army is marching inland. Uh, his objective, of course, is to try to capture the enemy capital at Mexico City. And uh, the U.S. Army clashes with the Mexican Army in the Battle of Cerro Gordo. Well, in the two or three days prior to that battle, Lee, a few others, but, but Lee especially, conducted reconnaissance and on one occasion, he was so far behind Mexican lines that um, uh, he heard voices coming near him. They were Spanish, speaking Spanish. He knew they were uh, Mexican soldiers. 
Lee dove behind a log, a tree that had fallen over, and he lays down. Uh, he kind of crunched himself up under this under this log as as far as he could get, and he lays there quietly, uh, without moving for hours. As Mexican soldiers come to this area, there's a little clearing here. Right on the other side of the log was a uh, a stream that flowed by. And Mexican soldiers came and um, filled their canteens. Some of them sat on the log just above Lee. And he stayed frozen in that position for hours until the sun went down when he was able to get back to uh, uh, within uh, the U.S. lines. But he is the one, Lee is the one from that reconnaissance mission who really maps out the flank attack that Scott will execute um, over the next couple of days, attacking the Mexican army in flank and in rear. Um, and then and then later on the outskirts of Mexico City, of course, Lee does the lion's share of the uh, reconnaissance work, also carrying Scott's orders back and forth um, uh, to the flanking column at the Battle of Contreras. So um, he, he learns valuable uh, lessons as, as a result of that. And then I have this phrase, making war on a map. I, I think, I, I don't know that anyone in the Civil War was better at making war on a map. And what I mean by that is, if you can imagine a commanding general a mile or two behind the front lines with a map out, laid out on the table, uh, with reports coming in from the left flank, from the right flank, and and from all around the battlefield, and the commander has to be able to interpret these reports, where are enemy forces, where are they going, what is likely their next move, and looking at a map and looking at the geographic features of a map and, and, and being able to discern what to do next. And Lee was a master at that. Well, Lee picked up the the basics of map making in in Mexico. Um, next slide, please. He um, halfway through the Mexico City campaign, <clears throat> the American army, uh, the U.S. Army, camped in Puebla, Mexico, for about two months, waiting for reinforcements to arrive. Now they were about seventy miles from Mexico City. And while they were in Puebla, Scott sent Captain Lee uh, over toward Mexico City to scout out the roads, the lakes, uh, the, the geography around Mexico City. And Lee was not the only officer. There, were, there was another engineer officer who, who did the same thing. Uh, they would come back. And Scott would quiz them on what they saw, what they found, um, what are the roads like, what's the best approach to Mexico City. What you have on your screen here is the map that Lee drew from his scouting and reconnaissance around Mexico City. And uh, if we were if we were in person and this map was on a, a big screen, it would be a little bit easier for you to see Mexico City is just about in the center of the map, but east and southeast of Mexico City are some large lakes. And Lee really has this, this, this map is, is uh, very, very accurate. This is the original map that Lee drew, and you can find it in the archives at VMI today. And if you compare this, next slide please, if you compare Lee's map with the map that is in the West Point Atlas of American Wars, it is remarkably similar. This, it amazes me to compare these two maps, how close Lee's map was just from his scouting, uh, how, how close he was able to get uh, all of these uh, topographical features. And so um, he learns uh, map making, he learns boldness, he learns the art of maneuver, he, 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 is, a, he is an excellent uh, sort of understudy for Winfield Scott, and he was actually Scott's favorite. Uh, Scott would later say that 
Robert E. Lee was the finest soldier that he had ever seen in the field. Next slide, please. Um, here is a map. This just, just to sort of illustrate, uh, I, I want to compare the Battle of Cerro Gordo with um, the Battle of Chancellorsville. Here is, um, uh, these arrows indicate the troop movements for Scott's army, the the U.S. troops, they began in the lower right-hand corner. And uh, if you can follow that, uh, that arrow around the National Highway and all the way around, uh, if, you, if you see uh, the label Twiggs and Riley, those two names, um, uh, th that is where uh, Scott's Army attacked the Mexican forces in the flank and even in the rear. Riley's, some of Riley's uh, men hit, hit the Mexican army uh, in the rear during the battle. Scott divided his army not once, but twice at the Battle of Cerro Gordo. And as I've already mentioned, Captain Lee is the one who really mapped out this, uh, this flank attack that you see that, that Twiggs took, uh, uh, the route that he, he took. Now, next slide. Um, here is a map of uh, the Battle of Chancellorville. Um, and Lee divides his army not once, uh, but twice. And his army is sort of swinging around to hit, uh, to hit Hooker and, and the Federal Army um, in the flank. And it, 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 if you could take the map of the Battle of Cerro Gordo and just invert it, you have very similar troop movements. Now, I'm not suggesting that Lee was thinking back to Cerro Gordo in the middle of the Battle of Chancellorsville. I, I'm just illustrating that, you know, past experience can inform decisions uh, uh, that, uh, that a commander makes on the battlefield. Next slide, please. So here's, here's another fellow. Maybe, you, maybe you've seen this image before. It's a pretty common image. Um, next slide. So that's Lieutenant McClellan. Uh, McClellan was another staff officer in Mexico. Um, next slide. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you just some a, a general description of the Mexico City campaign. McClellan is a lieutenant in in Scott's army, and 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 let me describe for you what Scott is doing in the Mexico City campaign. And, and you be thinking about McClellan and you tell me what, what this reminds you of. Of course, uh, Scott uh, marshaled all available resources under his command. He is shifting the, uh, the strategic, this is a strategic turning move. He's shifting the theater of operations from north of Mexico City where Taylor's army had been fighting. And Scott is going to land on the coast east of Mexico City, shifting the whole front of the fighting. Um, he's using secure water transportation, so he's going to have a secure supply line. Uh, Scott's objective is the enemy capital, which is the political nerve center of the enemy. Um, that is the essence of the Mexico City campaign. Does that remind you of anything in the Civil War that that uh, involved General uh, McClellan? You may be thinking about the Peninsula Campaign in 1862. And if you are, I would agree with you because I have for years believed and have argued uh, on numerous occasions that McClellan's Peninsula Campaign, when he moved his army, um, out into Chesapeake Bay and down the coast and landed an army east of Richmond uh, and tried to advance on Richmond from the east. Uh, I believe that McClellan was merely trying to replicate uh, the Mexico City campaign, which he was a part of 15 years earlier. Um, and next slide, in fact, this next slide actually uh, 
shows what McClellan will do when he tries to move his army. Um, next slide. We'll spend just a few minutes. I have to I have to spend just a minute talking about this fella, and he's in his heyday here. He's in he's probably about sixty years old when this portrait was painted, uh, but still um, energetic, healthy. Um, this this painting was done just after the Mexican War. Perhaps you recognize this as Winfield Scott, Scott who had been a general in the army since 1814. He was the youngest general um, at 27 years old. He was a general in 1814. He's still a general in the army, the highest ranking general in the United States Army. Uh, and he, he's in his heyday, heyday in this picture. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, most people who have who know who Winfield Scott was, who remember him, have heard of him, this is the Scott they know. This is the only Scott they know. He's in his mid-70s. He's in bad health. He weighs over 300 pounds. This is the Winfield Scott of the Civil War that most people are, fami are familiar with. I'll just say this about Scott. You may be familiar with his Anaconda plan, which uh, was uh, a label that was attached to his strategy that he devised for President Lincoln to uh, uh, to try to subjugate uh, the uh, the Confederate states, a naval blockade, uh, seizing the Mississippi River. Um, the Anaconda plan had political objectives. It did not emphasize major battles or annihilation of enemy armies. The Anaconda Plan was a was a uh, a plan of moderation. It was a moderate strategy. Well, when you look at the Mexico City campaign, which he commanded um, fifteen years earlier, he used a strategy of moderation there as well. Uh, he would fight a battle win a battle, win a victory, and then often he would pause and wait in hopes that the Mexican army would, uh, uh, Mexican government would uh, uh, ask for negotiations, uh, sue for peace, end the war. Um, he met, his objective in Mexico was never the destruction of the Mexican army, although he came very close to doing that at, in a couple of places. Next slide, please. And here's our next uh, Civil War general. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this image before. Uh, next slide. So that's Lieutenant Thomas Jackson. Um, Jackson, um, Jackson was the bold, brave, daring lieutenant uh, soldier in Mexico, the same as he would be. Uh, commanding troops in the Civil War. Um, he, uh, what, what you find in Mexico are some of the same qualities that are, um, that are prominent in the Civil War. Um, you, see, you see health issues, you see bravery, even recklessness. Uh, you see his religious fervor. Jackson was obsessed with being in combat. He wanted to be in combat. He was afraid that he would miss an opportunity to be in combat. In fact, just before getting to Mexico, Lieutenant Jackson told his brother-in-law, Daniel Harvey Hill, that he envied those who had been in combat. He said, I want to be in one battle. Well, he's going to get ample opportunity in Mexico. Uh, he was um, during the bombardment at Veracruz, on one occasion, a, a, a cannonball hit within about 10 feet of him. Those around, those around Jackson were impressed with his calm demeanor. Um, it didn't affect him that, um, that a, cannon, a cannonball hit so close to him. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a story about Jackson um, at the Battle of Chapultepec just outside of Mexico City, just before the fall of Mexico City, that really illustrates Jackson's, uh, uh, Jackson's bravery, 
uh, in combat. I'm going to I'm going to read to you a paragraph from I, I did a book about 16, 17 years ago on the Mexico City campaign called A Gallant Little Army. Shameless plug. So if you're interested in the Mexico City campaign, I can suggest a book uh, that I think you should buy and read. And actually, I don't even care if you read it, really. But uh, but I'm going to share with you uh, a paragraph. The Battle of Chapultepec, uh, Lieutenant Jackson is in command of, of uh, two pieces of artillery. Lieutenant Thomas Jackson led two six-pound field pieces up the road in support of the infantry. And as soon as the enemy opened fire, all 12 of the horses pulling his guns were killed or disabled. And one of the guns was damaged so badly that it was no longer serviceable. Unable to go any further, Jackson tried to unlimber the other gun on the spot, but incessant enemy fire caused his artillerymen to scramble for cover behind boulders and shrubs and on the side of the road. And Jackson, by himself, stays out in the road trying to get his gun uh, repositioned. Jackson is coolly walking on the roadbed under fire, musket balls kicking up dirt all around him, and he exhorted his men to come out and help him. This a quote. There is no danger, he shouted, later recalling that it was the only lie he ever told. See, he said, I'm not hit. And no longer had, uh, uh, no sooner had he said that than a cannonball hit between his feet and bounced through his legs. Well, this is the kind of soldier that, uh, that Lieutenant Jackson was. He was just fearless. And, uh, uh, and his comrades saw that and were amazed. Uh, one soldier commented that, Jackson was as calm in the midst of a hurricane of bullets as though he were on dress parade at West Point. Uh, so we see glimpses of the future uh, Stonewall Jackson, uh, even in Mexico. Next slide, please. Well, this, this fellow I think is pretty easy to recognize. Maybe you recognize him. Next slide. This is Lieutenant Colonel uh, Joseph E. Johnston. Well, in looking at Johnston, um, not um, not really looking at lessons in combat that he learned, but uh, what I want to share with you is a little bit about the uh, uh, the beginnings of a rank and seniority dispute, uh, something that. Uh, he famously uh, had this dispute with President Jefferson Davis during the Civil War, but the seeds were sown in Mexico. Next slide, please. So Joe Johnston uh, went to Mexico in 1846 as a captain. Uh, let me run through these ranks very quickly. He, he goes to Mexico as a captain. Uh, he's wounded at the Battle of Cerro Gordo in April 1847, and, and soon after, he is double promoted to lieutenant colonel. He completely skips over the rank of major. That's the seed uh, of this thorny problem that will resurface later. Well, a few months later, after Mexico City is captured in September of 47, uh, Joe Johnston was promoted to colonel. Now, the war ends in 1848, and, you know, the army had had uh, been inflated significantly during the war. And now during the drawdown, uh, the army is sort of top heavy and and uh, some officers are having their rank uh, reduced because the army is pretty, uh, 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 as I said, pretty top heavy. Well, Congress made Joe Johnston a uh, lieutenant colonel again demoted him to lieutenant colonel. Uh, he refused to recognize uh, the, uh, the demotion. He thought it was invalid. What Congress was doing actually was refusing to recognize that double promotion that he had gotten back in April. So Joe Johnston is not happy 
uh, about being a lieutenant colonel. A few years later, early 1850s, when Franklin Pierce is president, Jefferson Davis is secretary of war. Jefferson Davis is a fellow Mexican War veteran. Jefferson Davis was a, a classmate at West Point. So Johnston appealed to Secretary of War Davis. Um, Davis refused to rehear the case. Uh, that didn't go the way Johnston wanted it to. A few more years passed. Now, James Buchanan is president, and John B. Floyd from Virginia is Secretary of War. And it didn't, it didn't hurt that Johnston's brother was married to Floyd's sister. So Johnston appeals his case again. Floyd overturned the demotion from now a decade earlier, raised Joe Johnston back to full colonel. Furthermore, not long after, uh, Floyd named Johnston as the Army's new quartermaster general. And if you're named quartermaster general, that automatically comes with a promotion to brigadier general. So Joe Johnston was a brigadier general when the war comes to an end. I, I mean, I'm sorry. He's a brigadier general uh, when uh, southern states begin to secede, when the Civil War is beginning. Johnston was the highest ranking U.S. officer to resign from, from the United States Army and join the Confederacy. And so Johnston believed that he would then be the highest ranking Confederate general. He was disappointed when he saw the list of officers and discovered that he was fourth in line of seniority behind Samuel Cooper, Albert Sidney Johnston, and Robert E. Lee. And that is, that's the groundwork for the command disagreement, um, the dispute that would be ongoing uh, throughout the Civil War. And we won't get into that. Uh, move on. I've got a couple more things I want to touch on before I stop and, and open the floor for questions. Um, and I, I should mention, I, I really did not intend to highlight uh, George Gordon Meade, and that's Jennifer Murray's uh, subject, uh, her chapter in the forthcoming book. I will just say that uh, that that uh, Professor Murray highlighted Meade's uh, map, map making abilities, his uh, planning and logistics uh, but also Meade's aversion to the press, uh, his aversion to volunteer troops. Uh, and she wrote a very good chapter. Uh, so when, uh, if you get a copy of the book, uh, you, can, you can go right to uh, Professor Murray's chapter and, and read about George Gordon Meade. Well, uh, let me quickly share with you just a couple of other stories. Um, next slide, please. This is, um, this is not really a lesson learned sort of thing, but I want to share a couple of quick stories with you just to illustrate that all of these Civil War guys, they knew each other. Many of them had been good friends um, in the old army, and especially going back to Mexico. Here, here's uh, Philip Kearney and Richard Ewell. I, just very quickly, uh, at the Battle of um, Churubusco, this is just south of Mexico City, when the Mexican army uh, was defeated, they turned and retreated up into Mexico City. The first dragoons followed in pursuit. Kearney and Ewell were both in the first dragoons, and here they go galloping uh, along with some other uh, uh, mounted troops, galloping after the retreating Mexican army. When they got right up to the gates of Mexico City, uh, the Mexican army, opened their artillery. Uh, they shredded uh, the dragoons with grape shot and um, uh, it, um, uh, it shredded Kearney's left arm. Uh, Kearney's left arm had to be amputated after the Battle of Churubusco. 15 years later, both of these men were on the battlefield at Second Bull, in the Second Bull Run campaign, except that they're on different sides now. And uh, Ewell lost a leg fighting for the South. Kearney lost his life fighting for the North uh, at the battle at, at, at Second Bull Run. Next slide, please. I'll just say this about 
Longstreet and Pickett. They were both in the 8th Infantry in Mexico, uh, lieutenants. Uh, Longstreet was 25 years old. Pickett was 21. They both were in the attack at the castle uh, of Chapultepec. Longstreet was carrying uh, the regimental flag. He was shot uh, in the leg, wounded in the thigh. When he went down, Lieutenant Pickett came by, scooped up the regimental colors, and proceeded on in the attack. Um, and then 16 years later, both of these men were in Robert E. Lee's army at Gettysburg. And in that battle, uh, Longstreet is remembered for his opposition to Lee's aggressive offensive tactics. And Pickett is remembered as one of the primary agents of those same offensive tactics. Next slide. And this is our last slide but I want to say just a word about these fellows. Louis Armistead and Winfield Scott Hancock were very close friends in Mexico. Um, they were together all the time. Throw in Henry, uh, Henry Heath too. He was, he was a part of this uh, bunch of guys. They were messmates. They, they took all their meals together. They hung around together. And especially after the capture of Mexico City, when Mexico City was under occupation for about eight or nine months, 10 months, uh, they were in the city. And so now this, this story kind of falls under the heading of boys will be boys uh, because these young American officers, after the fighting was over and the treaty was being negotiated and they're, they're occupying the city and they, well, some of them are engaging in all kinds of vice uh frivolities uh company of the senoritas one soldier wrote about uh grant's excessive drinking in mexico city uh captain joseph hooker was popular with the senoritas in fact he had acquired the nickname el capitan hermosa uh, the beautiful captain but winfield scott hancock seemed to take the case he, he was a dashing, handsome young man, and all the young ladies liked Hancock, and he was a favorite. He got invited to all of the fandangos, all the dances, and uh, Heath and Armistead would later say that they, they learned to stay close to Hancock because when he would get invited to a fandango, all the officers who happened to be standing around in the same vicinity, they would get an invitation as well. So they knew they could they could go to these parties if they would stick pretty close to, to Hancock. Oh, by the way, Burnside, Ambrose Burnside, believe it or not. You you know, you I don't have a picture of him, but <laughs> you, you know the image of Burnside. Uh, he, he was seeing a young lady by the name of Anita, and when she caught him kissing another woman, uh, she attacked him with a knife. Uh, and so these are the kinds of things uh, happening in occupied Mexico City. But these these young army officers, um, uh, they were close comrades. They were friends. Some of them will fight together in the Civil War. Some of them will fight against each other at Gettysburg in Pickett's charge. Armistead commanded one of the brigades in Pickett's charge, and he knew. Uh, their objective was the center of the federal line. He knew that Hancock, Hancock's Corps, was defending that part of the line. And Armistead was one of the few who actually made it all the way up to the stone wall. Uh, he was wounded several times and actually kept captured by, uh, by uh, federal soldiers. And when he was be, being carried to the rear, uh, behind the federal army, he asked to see General Hancock. Well, Hancock had also been wounded and Hancock had been taken to the hospital. And they told Armistead that H Hancock was not available. Of course, Hancock survived. He even runs for president uh, a couple of decades later. But Armistead will die two days later, die from his wounds. So these guys had uh, relationships. They knew each other. Uh, they had experiences in Mexico that will that they'll carry with them a decade and a half later. Well, with that, I'm going to shut up. 
and I'm going to let you uh, see if you see if you have comments or questions. Uh, and Jen, if you have anything to add, uh, you certainly <laughs> can feel free to uh, to jump in there as well. Well, thanks, Tim, for a, for a great presentation uh, for this evening. We do have some questions in the chat box that I'll read to you. Uh, and I'll, if Dr. Murray certainly wants to ask something or chime in, reflect on anything you said, certainly feel free, Jen, to, to get on speaker. Um, we have a couple from uh, one of our participants who has left the chat, uh, the meeting, but he said, well, Jefferson Davis became president of the Confederacy rather than a general. What are your thoughts on how the Mexican War shaped his strategic and tactical outlook as commander in chief? Yeah, I I think um, uh, I mean Davis comes out of the Mexican War, especially the Battle of Buena Vista, as a hero. Uh, he he was obviously very knowledgeable. Uh, I think that probably contributed to Davis being sort of the micromanager that he was. Um, uh, you know, Davis tended to be very inflexible, and he was involved in all the decision making. I mean, there's a reason why he went through four or five secretaries of war uh, in in four years. Um, I so I guess. And I'm not a Davis expert, but I guess my impression is that his Mexican War experience uh, may not have uh, been uh, something that uh, would, would, would have a, a positive impact as, uh, as president of the Confederacy. And uh, I bet Skip knows the answer to this one, uh, but did, uh, hold on. Was, is Palo, Palo Alto, California, get its name from the Battle of Palo Alto? That's a good question, and I'm not sure. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> um, I know there's a Monterey, Tennessee, which I'm almost yeah. certain did not get its name from the Battle of Monterey. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, and there was there was fighting during the Mexican War in California, Battle of Los Angeles, the Battle of San Diego. I don't know where the name Palo Alto came from, my guess is it probably did not come from the Mexican War. Okay. Uh, another question regarding uh, the first slide where you showed uh, Lee and Grant meeting at Appomattox. Uh, do you think it reflected some hubris on Lee's part that he did not remember Grant? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think that Grant was insulted by that. And I don't think that Lee intended uh, to insult. I think Lee was just being honest. But uh, it does underscore the fact that in Mexico, Grant was really a nobody. And, and Lee Lee was uh, uh, someone that everyone knew who Lee was. Uh, no, I don't think there was any any ill will. Uh, and I don't think Grant took it that way. Okay. You know, being the Chickamauga and Chattanooga Civil around table, you cannot escape. You cannot get away from having a question about Braxton Bragg. Uh, <laughs> that is inevitable. And it has certainly come up tonight. Uh, from Rob, our good friend. Uh, curious to know about Braxton Bragg's rapport amongst his contemporaries by the end of the Mexican-American War. What was his reputation amongst his fellow officers during that time period? Um, about the same as they were during the Civil War. Uh oh, <laughs> he, 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 he was he was a martinet. Um, he he could be pretty tough on his men. In fact, um, on one occasion there was an assassination attempt. Again, I guess we would call it fragging. <laughs> against uh, Bragg when a group of soldiers um, uh, sort of tossed a, uh, uh, an exploding shell un under his tent and it actually exploded and it, it ripped his cot to shreds. He was in the tent, I think he was laying on the cot and, and tore his clothing, but miraculously Bragg was, was not injured. Um, 
uh, Bragg was was a very good artillery officer in Mexico, uh, but in in terms of uh, how his uh, uh, how his fellow officers and, and how his men viewed him, um, it wasn't much different from the way he was viewed in the Civil War. Yeah, but, uh... One more question, unless we get some more in the chat box. Uh, I think you'd probably agree if, if you read some, some biographies on Grant that serving as a quartermaster during the Mexican-American War really helped shape his tactical and operational skills in the Civil War. Uh, could you reflect more on that on with this focus on logistics during the Mexican-American War and, and really how that gave him some real greater insights uh, when the Civil War came around? Uh, you're talking about Bragg? Uh, Grant, rather. I'm sorry, Grant. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Grant. I, I, you may have said, you may have said Grant. Um, well, for one thing, um, you know, when you're a lowly lieutenant, you, you are learning, um, you're learning sort of the foundational level. That's the, the one thing that, uh, that I think he learns early on is the very basics of the difficulty of getting um, getting supplies from point A to point B. Uh, transportation was very important. The American army was always short of wagons in Mexico, uh, and they were constantly having to use uh, pack mules that they would scour from the countryside. And I think at a very practical level, uh, Grant, uh, Grant is understands uh, sort of issues and problems and probably I can't speak to this with great detail but probably was able to utilize uh, naval forces uh, to uh, uh, to great effect in helping him move supplies especially when you think about you know uh, all of France operations in, in the first two or three years of the war were along bodies of water either the Tennessee River or the Cumberland River or the Mississippi River. Um, and so um, he was able to utilize that and, and utilize the um, water transportation, I think, uh, to great effect. Um, and th there are stories about Grand in Mexico, the difficulties that he had just crossing rivers, just getting supplies across a river. Uh, so he would have been sensitive to that. Uh, that that may not fully answer the question, but um. thank you. Okay, Skip, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. First of all, it was fantastic uh, talk. By the way, I've got three pages of notes. Um, you know that I that I took. I've always been interested in the Mexican War. You know, coming from California, and uh, first of all, Palo Alto. I, I live in Palos Verdes, which means green sticks. <laughs> Uh, so I imagine Palo Alto just means woods, high woods or something like that. So I don't think there's anything, you know, to that. Uh, the first capital of California, of course, was Monterey, but it's spelled differently. There's only one R uh, in it as opposed to the Mexican. Uh, just have a, a couple of uh, comments and then a question. Um, I wanted to comment on Grant's messy appearance at Appomattox. Um, it's well, you know, noted and it's, it's brought up that he didn't, didn't care. And it really did go along with the idea of, of Grant following Taylor and Lee following Scott, as far as their style, uh, Taylor, I think wore a big plantation hat, um, you know, in, in the door and Grant typically wore civilian, civilian clothes in during the civil war. Uh, but you'll note that his, his, um, Picture, the famous picture at Cold Harbor, which you displayed, um, he spiffed up for that. He got his beard trimmed, he wore his best uniform and that for the photographer to show up. So he wasn't totally immune to that. And in fact, at Appomattox, he, he ran so fast to catch Lee after Petersburg, he left his luggage a couple of days behind him. So basically he was wearing the same clothes for several days by the time he met Lee. So I just wanted to, to, to throw that out and, and, and say that I, I think if his clothes were there and he had the time, he probably would have dressed a little better. 
Uh, the second thing, which you really did answer, and this is a question I planned on asking, um, is that I never really understood how Lieutenant Longstreet, in charge of nobody, um, got experience to lead 15,000 men. The armies in the Mexican War were no more than about 3,500. Is that correct? Uh, Scott's army was about nine or 10,000. Okay, that much. Uh, I didn't and, think and, it and was... Taylor's too. About, about 10,000 in both cases, yeah. Okay, actually, I thought it was, there were more like, you know, three or 4,000. So that does it. But, you know, Lee, who was, who was a wonderful engineer and, of course, you know, considered the best soldier, all of a sudden he's leading 90,000 men and, and Grant's leading 120,000 men. Um, I never could really say, really? They got experience to do that? from, you know, leading, leading, you know, the small group, but you really did give me some really good elements of, of where they, they uh, came from. And I appreciate that. That was really well taken on my part. And yeah. And, and just, just a comment, no one had, had led more than say 12, 15,000 men in combat. No American general had led right. more than 12, 15,000. And so they were all sort of, doing something completely new yeah uh, but but I, I think they they learned at a rudimentary level the basics of command and how to treat soldiers and how to get things done and then some of them could translate that on a much grander scale some of them could not mm -hmm. yeah the examples you gave with with lee especially at uh that at mexico city and in and uh uh, Chancellorsville versus, you know, Sarah Gorda. I mean, really, you can see, you know, where, where he at least got the germination of an idea. The last question I have is uh, that, that we paid, I think, $15 million to the Mexican government, but we didn't pay them actually anything. We reduced their debt $13 million, and we uh, took over, I think, $2 million worth of debt that American citizens own the government. But Grant, for one, thought it was a totally unjust war. And here I am um, enjoying living in California and the incredible bounties the United States give, gave, gave us. And I look a little further south and see a metropolis of San Diego and then a train wreck like Tijuana right next to it. Um, do you believe it was an unjust war? Um, in some respects, I, I think that it was because it was, uh, as I said at the beginning, it, it was basically a land grab. This was mm -hmm. Polk's vision. I mean, Polk ran on an expansionist platform, James K. Polk. And uh, 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 he, he realized all that he wanted to accomplish. Um, and in that respect, I mean, I mean, Mexico had been a sovereign government for about 25 years when the Mexican War began. Right. Uh, Mexico had been through, I think, over 40 presidents. In, the, in that 25 year time period. So there was a lot of instability, a lot of political corruption. Um, and and you could look at it this way. The North American continent was a continent that was up for grabs and had been up for grabs for a hundred years from yeah. the Mexican War. Uh, Spain had laid claim to some of it. France had, uh, the British had, uh, the Americans had, and who's going to end up with it? Well, it, it just so happens that the United States would end up with it. Uh, how did they do that? Probably because they were just they were just stronger and you know bigger and stronger and able to um, and able to defeat a weaker southern mm -hmm. nation. Mm -hmm. In that respect. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can see how, how uh, you could view this as an unjust war. Uh, and here's another thing that really sort of, and, and you're well aware of this, this really rubs salt in the wound. It was, 
I mean, literally within days, a couple of weeks or so, after the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, gold is discovered in California. <laughs> you know, over the next, what, 10 years or so, over $100 million of gold is going to be pulled out of the mountains and streams of California. You talk about you, you talk about, you know, rubbing salt in, in the wound. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Because I, I always um, looked at, at uh, the Army, um, the Army of Observation mm -hmm. became the, op the Army of Occupation, became yeah. the Army of in Invasion, yeah. um, you know, through that. You know, but, but you know, I... I never really thought of what you just said about Cal California and the gold rush uh, really did happen, you know, so, so quickly afterwards. It was, yeah, 1848. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody was there in 1849. And now yeah. they named the football team after it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and then of course we know, we know what happens as a result of all this new territory that, the United States uh, acquires as a result, result of the war. It just it just puts the country on fast track um, to mm -hmm. 1860, 61. It highlights the slavery question and whether slavery would be allowed to expand into these new Western territories. And and, and it, it just it's like putting the pedal to the metal in, in terms of, you know, going down the road to to civil war. That's what happens after the war with Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, you know that's that's really true. I just just thought of it as you were saying it, um, and it makes so much sense. Is that when you think about it, the Civil War, to begin with, really wasn't about slavery in the states. It was about slavery in the territories. Well, it, it, and, yes, it, it, yes, yes, right, um, which was the Republican platform, uh, and and um, you know. Expansionists wanted to expand for different reasons. Some of them, as an outlet for slavery, to expand mm -hmm. further west. But others had other motivations. It, it uh, there, there are a variety of motivations behind it. Sure. And, yeah. I, and here's another thing that's a little bit ironic too. Uh, Henry Clay from Kentucky, who was opposed to the war, lost a son at the Battle of Buena Vista. Oh. Um, so um, um, Joseph E. Johnston lost his nephew at the Battle of Contreras, a nephew that he looked at like a son, and he was heartbroken uh, when he discovered that after the battle, when he discovered that his that his nephew Preston had uh, had been mortally wounded and had, had in fact died from his wounds. Mm, yeah. well, anyways, yeah, thank you Richard, very much. Richard yeah. Yule, by the way, Richard Yule lost a, uh, a brother. His brother Thomas oh. was killed at the Battle of Cerro Gordo, and uh, Richard was there on top of this this hill. Uh, La Talaya was a, a, a hilltop that the Mexicans had fortified, and the Americans captured that hill uh, during the battle, and that is where Thomas Yule was mortally wounded. He lived for about uh, probably 10 or 12 hours. He lived into the night and uh, Dick, Richard Yule, uh, was with him late that night when he died and later wrote a very poignant letter to their mother that, uh, that describes in great detail uh, Thomas's final hours and that he died the honorable death. You know, soldiers make a big deal out of, out of an honorable death. Uh, so anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to get off track. Mm -hmm. No, but very, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I Just as you started in the beginning when they confused it with the Alamo and, and any number of things, uh, I don't think people understand how important the Mexican War was, uh, not only to giving us the for, you know, the, the southwest of our country, uh, but also uh, also, you know, training our training our officers, you know, as we go. And it really affected so many uh, things in our country for the next half century. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. It was great. Yeah. Thank you, folks. Any other uh, any other questions for for Dr. Johnson? I have uh, I have one comment. 
Um, you know, just listening to uh, to you, Skip, and and Tim, um, what sticks in my mind about the history of California is that uh, you know before 1769, uh, it was the Native Americans there. In, in 1769, uh, the Spanish came in, and in 1821, Mexico controlled California, and by 1848, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. It was the, the United States that controlled California. So when I think about the, the very, I think about the very short time period uh, that Mexico controlled California, in the large scheme of things, in, in my mind, uh, things are very fluid and dynamic and still up for grabs for, for permanency there. So uh, if whatever that's worth, uh, that's, that's my take. Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're right. Um, you're you're right. One of the things that uh, one of the points you can make is that you know California was just easy takings. I mean, it was e easy pickings because uh, the Mexican government had, uh, for the past twenty years, had had a lot of difficulty exerting control and authority that far north, and so uh, California was just sort of there. Uh, had, had beautiful coastline and deep harbors, and it was a very des desirable piece of land. And um, so uh, it, it becomes a primary objective of the Polk administration. Okay, any other comments or questions? Nope, okay. Hey, Dr. Johnson, on behalf of all the members here at, at Chickamauga and Chattanooga and in Zoom land. I just want to uh, thank you very much for spending the last hour plus with us and a great presentation. A lot of positive comments and we look forward to your book coming out, sir, and wish you a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you and your family and to all of our members watching. So thank you very much and happy, uh, happy New Year. Merry Christmas to all of you. Thanks for joining in tonight. Okay. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, Ed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Folks, I, I'm sorry. I, I can't stick around and chat. I've got some personal affairs I got to take care of. <laughs> so, uh, but I wish you all a great Christmas. Uh, be safe out there and we'll see you next month. Okay. Thank you.